Okay, well, hello, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm with Watershed. We're a, a learning analytics platform. We use XAPI data and, and to do learning analytics. Apologies to those of you who were expecting a, a concert at this point. Uh, no, it's not 21 pilots, the band. This is 21 learning analytics pilot projects that you could try in your organization. Good to get some laughter in there. Thank you for those, those emojis. Um, now, just to say, all of these uh, ideas that I'm going to be sharing uh, this evening, this morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, all of these are real things that real organizations are doing. These aren't just ideas that I've come up with that I think would be nice if someone did. These are real things that people are doing with XAPI, uh, real learning analytics projects. Um, and what I found with learning analytics at different organizations, no two organizations are the same. There are lots of different ways to do learning analytics. There's more than one way to slice a cat, to mix a couple of metaphors. Uh, and so today we're gonna to look at 21 different ways of doing it. Um, and the aim of this presentation isn't to tell you how to do it, because I don't have time to tell you how to do these 21 different projects, but it's just to inspire you, to tell you this is what's happening out there. And maybe you could pick one of these 21 ideas, just one that you could do in your own organization. And then if you want to know how to do it, I'm planning to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so you can always ask me how to do it at the end. And also quick shameless plug, um, is that we are um, doing a blog series uh, that's going to be published in January on the Watershed blog that there's a post for each of these 21 different ways of doing learning analytics, plus one more actually, it's 22, but that didn't work with a pun. Um, and for each of those, we're talking about how to make the business case for that particular project. So if you enjoy this presentation, uh, look out for that blog series coming in, in January on the Watershed blog. Uh, so I'm going to start my timer and we're going to spend one minute on each of these different ways of doing learning analytics. So the first one is learner analytics, using data, perhaps from XAPI, to look at what your learners are doing. This is gonna be relevant for people like line managers or people who are interested in the people in your organization, but maybe less interested in the learning content or the learning experiences themselves. So just two examples on your screen. One is team dashboards. So a manager might wanna just keep track of what his team, his her team are, are doing. Um, another example, observation checklists. And uh, there's a number of, uh, I think we heard from N Nebraska Medicine earlier on this stream. Um, they're using observation checklists to monitor what's happening in the hospitals. Are people applying the learning? Um, those sorts of things. And there's lots of other organizations using observation checklists tools like uh, used to be called Zappy app, I think it's now Zappify, um, to, to capture that kind of data. Learner transcripts are another type of um, learner analytics. Um, so just presenting to a learner all of the different learning experiences that they've done, because of course, learning doesn't just happen in the LMS, uh, learning happens in lots of different places. And so the beauty of XAPI is that you can collect a learner's data uh, both historical data and present data, bring it all together into one system in that standard format, that XAPI format, and then present it in dashboards a little bit like the one that's on the screen there. So the learner can see all of their learning, whether that's for compliance reasons, you know, they've got to record, they've, they've earned a certain number of hours training perhaps, or they just want a central record of all of their learning. Um, another example, digital credential analytics. So this is collecting data about things like digital badges. And um, I think digital badges have come on quite a journey. Uh, probably five, ten years ago, if you talked about digital badges, you were talking about gamification, making learning fun. You, know, you get a bright, colourful badge if you complete this course. But actually, I think digital credentials, or as, as I'm now trying to call them, digital credentials have grown up a little bit from that digital badges origins. And actually, we've got clients who are using these digital credentials um, in quite robust and serious ways so that the digital credentials can actually sit alongside traditional qualifications as a real achievement that's very robustly assessed. And so you can, again, use XAPI to track that. You can then report on 
how much are these digital credentials actually being earned? Are people actually you know, meeting these criteria? And then how are they sharing them? Are they posting them on their LinkedIn profile? Uh, are they then getting likes? Those, those kinds of different things. Um, another one that you might not think you need, but actually is, is perhaps more valuable than you might realize, cheating detection. Whether that's people uh, cheating at assessments, or just finding ways to work around completing content that they're supposed to complete. Just give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, we had one client who they were looking at the various assessments that they um, and they wanted to know how many times are people completing those assessments, um, how many times and how long are people spending completing those assessments. And they found there was this one assessment that just stood out from the crowd that people were taking the average number of attempts was not just in double figures, but it was in high double figures. The average time taken was like that on average, people were spending an entire day in order to pass this assessment. Turned out people were just trying the assessment again and again and again until they passed, because if they didn't pass that assessment, they couldn't continue working in their job. Uh, and so they weren't, they didn't actually, they weren't competent but they were managing to pass the assessment just by trying it again and again and again. So really important for the organization to know that. And I've run out of time for the next example, but you can ask me about it later if you like. Uh, skills analytics. So skills, obviously the buzzword at the moment, uh, collecting XAPI data about what skills people have in the organization, where those skills are. So on the one hand, you can identify where you've got the skills that you need, uh, and on another hand, you can identify where you've got gaps in skills. Where is it that there's a particular skill that you know you need, but actually you don't have enough people with that skill? So you can then hire for to fill that gap or produce training uh, for people internally to try and, and meet that skills gap. Uh, extended enterprise analytics. Uh, so a lot of organizations have people who aren't actually part of the organization. They're not employees. Um, that are completing learning content, whether that's customers or perhaps more commonly, it's uh, where it's a company that's producing something that is sell, sold by somebody else. So you're training salespeople um, in another organization. There's challenges uh, around that in that they these other organizations often have lots and lots of different systems. Um, and you but if you want the data, you, you need to collect it from all those different systems. XAPI can help with that because it's a standard data format where you can bring all of that data together in one place and you can then be reporting on your learners, even if they're in other organizations, even if they're using a whole variety of different systems. Uh, so all of those examples so far are examples of, of learning, le sorry, learner analytics, looking at the learners themselves rather than really focusing on the, the content. Um, so and that, the next few that we're going to look at are around the area of learning content. So uh, a great example that I managed to find in Watershed was some analytics from, I think it's last year's XAPI party or yeah, uh, 2021. Uh, so the, the some some previous XAPI parties and looking at which resources were most popular. Which of the videos did people watch after the fact? And perhaps that's useful information to Megan and the team to see when they're choosing. Uh, you know, which presentations they're going to invite back. Uh, you know, who's who's then getting the most watches on on the videos after the fact. This other one uh, is quiz game analytics. Uh, so looking at for a particular for all different types of learning content. So quiz game is just an example of that. Um, and the great thing about XAPI is the flexibility. So it means that whatever type of learning content you've got, whatever the relevant questions are for that content, you can then collect data about that and report on it or use the data in other ways. Uh, a particular type of learning content analytics, scrap learning. So identifying the learning content that you're paying for or that you paid to produce, um, but is actually not being used. So two examples of reports on, on that data might be a report that looks at content that's just not being used. Uh, so this one's looking at content that's got less than 50 views. Or the one on the right is looking at content that might be used by some parts of the organization, but not by others. One of our clients was able to save quite a bit of money 
by identifying that a certain library of content was really being used by one department in the organization and not being used by anyone else that that much. They were then able to restrict the content licenses just to the department that's using the content and then obviously save a lot of money on licenses because they're no longer licensing this content for learners that aren't actually using it. Um, another sort of angle on that is uh, vendor management. So this is rather than looking at individual pieces of content, this is perhaps comparing different vendors, whether they're content vendors or whether they're platform ven vendors. So the example on the left, uh, it's looking at content library utilization. So can you, t you know, if you're paying a certain amount per learner, but actually only 60%, 80% of your learners are using it, how much are you actually paying per learner for the actual learners that are using it? And you could perhaps track that over time and see how that changes and get a real idea of, of the value you're getting from that content library. Or perhaps you're comparing different platforms. You know, maybe you've got to make budget cuts. You've got to get rid of one of your learning platforms. Uh, well, which one is, is the least well used? Which one is having the least impact? Um, and that's the kind of analysis that you might be able to do, again, by collecting all that data together in a, a common format in one place. Uh, so enhanced platform reporting, a lot of learning analytics is about, as I've said, bringing data from lots of systems all together in one place. But actually, sometimes you can get a lot of value just from one system. And particularly for a pilot project, that can be a really good place to start. If you've got one system where you really need reporting that that system doesn't provide, maybe the reports in the system aren't detailed enough and you just want some, some better reporting, then you can pull that, that uh, data out into a system, perhaps like Watershed, for example, uh, that might allow you to get more detailed, uh, better reporting. Or perhaps it's just certain reports that the system doesn't have, and you're able to pull the data out, but you can't see that data in, in reports. Um, well, again, you could pull that data into a system like Watershed and, and view the reports in there. Um, learning impact measurement. This is perhaps the one that gets talked about the most when we think about um, learning analytics, but it's not its not the only one. It's one of, of, of many possible uses. Um, so this might be things like looking at, has the learning had an impact in the workplace? So you collect data about the learning, but you also then use observation checklists to monitor actually are people applying that in the workplace? Is this learning improving competency? You may have come across the, the applied case study. That's what's been talked at, about at conferences before, uh, where applied are using XAPI data. They're collecting data from, um, from e-learning assessments about competency and then combining that with data uh, from uh, KPI data about the performance of, of managers in these service centers uh, in order to, to, to inform coaching so that they can identify those managers where they've got the knowledge, but they're not quite applying it. Uh, and a little bit of coaching can then have a really big impact because the underlying knowledge is already there. Uh, search analytics. This is probably my favorite one at the moment. I don't, maybe I shouldn't have favorites. Um, but a lot of learning analytics is looking at what are learners doing? What are they actually learning? Which is, is really, really uh, valuable information to have, of course. But search analytics answers a different question, which makes it so valuable. It tells you what do learners want to learn? So they might be learning all about one particular topic because that's the content that you've got. But if you can look at what are people actually searching for, that can become really valuable. And then you can tailor your content um, to then address those needs. Uh, we've had organizations doing this kind of analytics where they've, they've rolled out to a particular part of their organization. And on the first day of their rollout, they've been able to identify there's a particular topic that they're not providing for their learners, and they could then find some relevant content and put it out there straight away. So you can become incredibly responsive to learners, which of course has been really important over the last two years, as you know, we've had some pretty dramatic shifts towards you know, uh, working at home and all those, those sorts of things. Um, I'm getting a little bit behind, but that's all right. Uh, so we talked about learner analytics, which is looking at the learner themselves. We've talked about learning content analytics, which is looking at your learning program, your, your learning content, which is obviously really relevant to people producing the content. 
And these next few are looking at learning program analytics. So a learning program is a, a collection of, of learning experiences that are being completed by a, a learner. And just a couple of examples on the screen there, you might track how a learner is progressing through a particular program, or you might want to ask what route are they taking through this program? If, if you've, you're giving learners options on what what uh, what they want to complete, how they want to consume you know, different uh, modalities of learning content, well, which are they choosing? Which are the, the more popular pathways? Uh, a particular, again, learning uh, game analytics. Um, so that might be a particular type of learning program is a game. And games tend to be fairly unique learning experiences. Uh, sometimes they're, they're quiz games, and all, all quiz games have certain similarities in data. But other times, games are something completely different. And because games are so unique, you really need to have unique reporting and unique data. And that's where the flexibility of XAPI helps. Um, you can also use the data in real time to do things like leaderboards. So you might take uh, some software that's not designed for a game, but you can turn it into a game by using that data in real time and uh, creating some leaderboards. In fact, we had uh, one year we partnered with Lectora at a, at a conference, and they had a game that they'd created in, in their Lectora offering tool, um, and they actually embedded a watershed report into the course. So when you got onto the last slide of this course, it presented you with a leaderboard that sort of told you how you were doing. Um, so you can, you can use those leaderboards in real time. Ecosystem analytics. So this is uh, looking at the whole ecosystem. This is where you've got lots and lots of different platforms, lots of different content vendors, and you're bringing all that data together uh, to analyze it in one place, comparing different reports. And um, if you're interested in this, obviously there's the Visa case study and the Caterpillar case study on, on the Watershed website that you can have a look at. Compliance reporting. Now, I know this isn't everyone's sort of favorite thing to do, uh, particularly on a party Friday night. Um, but actually, you know, compliance reporting is really important to the business, isn't it? It's something that that, that does need to be done. Uh, one of our clients uh, talks about gateway data, uh, where sometimes you've got to give the business the data that they want. Uh, he's using an analogy of gateway drugs there, which perhaps isn't the, the best <laughs> Uh, the, the most pleasant analogy, but the idea is gateway data to get you hooked on the data. So you give the business what they want and um, you then get them hooked on the data and then you can sort of do some of the more exciting things. And so compliance reporting may be one of those, whether that's looking at the number of hours of learning someone's completed, the value of XAPI there is that you can include stuff from other systems. It's not just one system. Uh, just giving people more flexibility of where they complete that mandatory learning. And then, of course, just mandatory training, making sure that people have completed the training that they're supposed to have completed. Um, platform launch analytics. So you've got a new platform. It's launch day. You don't want it to all fall flat on its face. And if it does fall flat on its face, you want to know about it straight away because then you can fix it and you can go and address it. And so we've had a, a number of clients who are, are launching a new platform and they want sort of down to the hour analytics of uh, collecting that data flows in in real time via X API and they can see exactly what's happening with the platform, who's using it, who's not using it, um, how are people using it, are there any issues being encountered? Uh, and so X API can be really useful for this sort of platform particularly for launch day or launch week or launch month. Um, and, you know, you look at it in gradually less detail as, as time goes on. Um, one that, you know, I probably wouldn't have mentioned a few years ago in this presentation, but crisis learning analytics. You know, we, we've, we've been in a, a time of crisis where, where the world changed very rapidly, you know, almost overnight. Um, we had to move from face-to-face -face training in a lot of cases to online training and some some particular topics that we thought no these are always going to be face to face we couldn't we can't possibly move those online had to move online because we couldn't be face to face and um, not only what did organizations see a massive rise in online learning um, you know all of a sudden all your licenses have been used up you thought you had plenty of licenses but everyone's now learning online uh, also people um, that you know moving to, to new ways of learning that then requires data 
so that you can make sure that people are actually still learning in this, this new modality and keeping track of what the topics, uh, which topics are more popular. And I know a number of organizations, if you've got analytics in place before the crisis happens, it's then really useful to be able to identify what are the topics that people want to learn about and then respond to that and support your organization through the crisis. Uh, so we don't know what the next crisis will be, whether it will be another global crisis or perhaps a crisis just within your organization. Who knows? Um, but if you've got analytics in place before the crisis, that then allows you to respond to it um, much more in an informed way using, using that data. Uh, it's not just the corporate world where XAPI data and learning analytics are relevant. Um, we've got, uh, I think, one or two clients in the, the academic learning space. Um, and they're looking at things like student engagement. So how engaged are students on their course? And are they likely to drop out as a result of that? And can we predict which students are going to drop out based on various engagement metrics? Um, and so some of the reporting is also looking at not just which students are engaged, but also actually measuring the engagement metrics themselves. Is this engagement metric a good predictor of whether or not the student is going to go on and complete the course? Um, so that's collecting XAPI data about the student's learning and also about do they actually finish the course um, at the end? Do they pass? Um, and potentially other, other success metrics as well. Uh, but it's not just humans that like data. Um, computers like data too. And so it's not just reporting. Uh, automation is, is another use of XAPI data. Um, and so one example within Watershed, we have this thing called workflows, um, where you can set up watersheds that it, it will watch for certain pieces of data. And then based on that data, it will do certain things. Uh, so it can make an API call to another system to, uh, to trigger something else. Um, automated report delivery um, is, again, another form of automation, just delivering learning analytics to, to people there. Um, finally, number 21, software usage analytics. So what we found is that it's not just learning analytics um, that people use XAPI for. We found an, a number of our clients that are using Watershed, they're using XAPI for learning. They've also got software that they produce in-house, whether they're selling that to clients or whether they're just using it in-house. And they found that actually XAPI works really well for tracking software. And we're not alone in this. I actually, as I was thinking about this presentation, I remember a story from another company um, way back in the early days of XAPI, uh, they were working for a computer game company and providing training for that computer game company. And they actually put XAPI tracking in the computer game to track how these uh, sort of customer support agents were learning how to use the computer game. So we're not the first, I don't think, to, to do tracking in software. It's, it's been done before as well. Um, and yeah, people have found that actually it, it's very helpful, whether that's looking at things like dev device usage, um, so are people using the software on an iPad or an iPhone or a different device? Or perhaps it's, it's different versions of the software, keeping track of which version of the software is actually being used by people so you can manage your support and, and those sorts of things. Or another one is error analytics. What are the errors that people are seeing in the application? What are the things that are going wrong? Uh, and then you can look to address those errors or look closely at the data. What are the steps that then lead to those errors? so that you can perhaps uh, replicate them more precisely. So it's not just learning analytics. XAPI can be used in different ways as well. Um, so I think I was, I was 22 minutes rather than 21 minutes, but that, hopefully you can, you can forgive me there. And uh, as an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, perhaps some of you have asked some questions as we've gone. Uh, if not, do be typing your questions now. If there's any of those that you want me to go into more detail, um, I've got sort of pages of, of notes. I wrote way too much for this presentation. Um, I've got, you know, other examples of case studies for each of these. I can tell you a little bit about how to do some of them. Or if you've got any other questions, um, do do type those in the chat now. Um, do ask me about any of those. So am I seeing any questions in the chat? 
Um, Megan saying, cheating? No, never saw it. Iterate instead of cheating. Yeah, I mean, it, you can consider trying and trying again at an assessment as, as a way of learning, uh, and certainly, you know, for formative assessments. I think in, in the particular case that we saw, this was an, a, like a really high stakes assessment, um, and the num the amount of time that people were spending on it probably suggested that they they won't they didn't quite know uh, what they needed to know. But yes, and so do do send your questions in. Um, I'm not sure if I'm if there's oh here we are. Here's a question from Frank. Hey Andrew, what I hear you saying is that XAPI is a technology function. If software usage analytics, maybe is that maybe of a technology function of software usage anal analysis rather than an LD task tool? Um, so, oh, the question comes up on the screen. Isn't that nice? So, it, so Frank, absolutely, XAPI can be used for software usage analytics. Um, it's obviously primarily designed for learning and development, primarily designed for capturing data about learners. Um, but what I'm saying is people have found other uses for it. And we've actually had a few organizations where tracking what people do in a piece of software has been something that people have, have found XAPI does work well for. And I suppose it's not surprising because really, if you're looking at what how a learner is interacting with a piece of training, um, that that's essentially a piece of software, isn't it? And so it, it is a similar kind of thing that people are doing when you're interacting with a piece of software as when you're undertaking a learning experience. So I think that's probably why, why that works there. Does anybody have any other questions? I'll give you plenty of time. I'll, I'll allow plenty of time for questions. I was hoping for somebody to say, oh, or maybe you can tell me in the chat which one of those, um, which one of those 21 learning analytics pilots, which one might you like to try? Oh, we've got a question from Matt. You, but while I'm answering this question, be typing in the chat, which one of these learning analytics pilots might you try in your organization? So, Matt, I think you know the answer to this one, Matt, don't you? But good question. Do you know if there are clients that convert other data sources, like non-X API, like CSV or other, other APIs, to ingest in Watershed for analysis alongside their XAPI learning data. So yes, um, probably most of our clients have data sources that don't natively support XAPI. And so a, a common um, path for, for setting them up and integration is that we ingest a CSV file, normally via an API, so it's an automated CSV file. And then we process that CSV file. We have what we call a data conversion engine, which is a, a fancy name for something that takes a CSV file and turns it into XAPI data. So even though the data source doesn't support XAPI, we're still able to have the data and get the benefits of XAPI by having the data in that standard format alongside all of the other data. And then, of course, when they come to get the data out, if they want to transfer the data out, it's in that standard XAPI format, and that makes it easier to use. Um, a good story along those lines. Uh, one of our clients, they they set up uh, an LMS on the back end, an LXP on the front end, analysis in Watershed. They actually swapped out their LMS. They changed from one LMS to another LMS. But because they had their LXP on the front end, it didn't affect the learners on the front end. And because they had their learning analytics on the back end and all standardized via XAPI, it didn't affect the reporting either. So people using reports and learners all had a consistent experience even though the underlying LMS that was sort of hosting everything had, had changed. Um, so that's a, a sort of real benefit of, of XAPI there. Um, I can see in the Q&A, if we have more time, I'd love to hear more about how Caterpillar or Visa used XAPI Watershed in their learning ecosystem analytics. Yeah, I mean, do have a look at the blog as well, Frank. Um, but... Yeah, so in both cases, they're uh, organizations that have a lot of different systems and they're then bringing all of that data in one place but, because they essentially didn't necessarily have visibility of all of their learning data. 
that allows them to see what's being used, what's not being used. So kind of some of the, the scrap uh, learning, the vendor management stuff that I talked about, um, because they can see all their vendors together. They, they can do that sort of thing and just gives them that overarching view of, of everything that's going on. Caterpillar is a good example of the, the extended enterprise thing as well, because they obviously sell their, their vehicles and their machinery through dealers. Um, and the dealers often have different learning systems. And so it's a way that they can bring data from all the learners together, even if they're, they're accessing, um, even if they're using different systems. Um, so Claire's saying that the search analytics would be interesting to implement. Yeah, as I say, that is that is my favorite one. And I do think it is just really, really informative. Um, either like initially when you first set it up, you can see where there's a mismatch between what you're providing for people and what they actually want to learn. Um, but then once you've you've addressed that and you've got a bit of a closer synergy, then in an ongoing basis, you're then looking for where that changes. Um, and so you're seeing, okay, now people are searching for this. This is obviously, this is a new hot topic. Let's make sure we're providing data, uh, we're, we're providing reporting analytics for that. And in terms of how you set that up, um, in every case that I think I've seen it done, it's with an LXP because LXPs are often a tool that people use to, to search for content. Um, LXPs often have really good search tools. And so you want an LXP that has XAPI support, ideally. Uh, obviously, Matt's question about CSV files, you can get the data if it doesn't support XAPI, but it helps to have XAPI. So if you're getting an LXP, do make sure they've got good XAPI support and specifically ask them, do you have tracking of your search facility? Um, I'd, I'd make sure that that's the number one question I would be asking an LXP vendor if I was looking for uh, an LXP. I'm interested in capturing uh, learning and training analytics using augmented and virtual reality. Do you have uh, any examples? What are the challenges? Um, do I have any good examples of augmented and virtual reality? So we do we do have clients that are doing augmented and, and virtual reality training. I'm actually not aware of how they're doing the data. Um, but in terms of the challenges, I have been involved in, in projects that have actually more pilot projects around virtual reality, uh, where the, the challenge with, with virtual reality, and I think this also applies to augmented reality, is you, there's a lot of data there. Um, because actually, for, to, in order for virtual reality to work, every time you move your head, the system knows that you've moved your head. It knows the exact position of your head down to the millimeter and the, the orientation. So there's huge amounts of data. And so the challenge is, well, what, what's actually relevant? What's the useful data that I'm going to track? Uh, and my advice there is to look at um, what are the sort of key decision points that people make in the virtual world? You know, do they... We had one example uh, where it was putting out a fire and you had to decide which fire extinguisher am I going to pick up? That's a key decision point. Where am I going to aim my fire extinguisher? At the base of the fire, at the top of the fire, over my shoulder? Um, yeah, that's another key decision point. I'd probably try and treat it as though you're almost tracking a real world experience because the virtual experience is, is so similar to a real world experience. Think about what are the, the things that you would want to observe if you had someone watching somebody? And, and what are the, the, the key decision points that people make? Yeah, great question. Um, have we, oh, we got off from Megan. Uh, learning analytics is all the rage, and that means that we're all learning a lot and making a lot of mistakes. Can you share some of the mistakes that we should try to avoid? Um, oh, that's also <laughs> where, where to start. So, I mean, there's mistakes that you can make in terms of how you structure XAPI data. Um, and list the full systems, Matt. So I think, well, you know, make sure you read my, my XAPI implementation guide is my advice to avoid those mistakes. Uh, but things like, you know, just being careful about what verbs and activity types you use. Um, be careful about when you use an extension and when you don't. Um, make sure you have processes. You know, uh, so, okay, I, I, and another another guide you should read is, is the XAPI governance guide. You can, you can Google that later on. Um, so you can, make sure you have processes in place to make sure you've got good XAPI data. 
what what I mean by that, or maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little story to, to illustrate that. There was one organization that, that we worked with where they actually did have processes in place in terms of creating e-learning courses, that process in place to make sure that those courses all had a unique ID, which is necessary. You need to have a unique ID for all your learning courses. Otherwise, when you're looking at the data, you don't know which, uh, which course you're actually talking about. Um, Unfortunately, they had a change of staff and the process didn't get carried over. And they ended up in a situation where every time they updated any of their courses, they were republishing it with exactly the same activity ID every time. So they, it was as though all of their learning suddenly became one course in, in their reporting. And then it just became possible to see what courses people had completed what they had, it, 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 it made a real mess. So that, that was quite difficult. So make sure you have processes in place in terms of XAPI governance. If you don't know what processes you should have, read uh, read the XAPI governance guide um, and then make sure those processes are kind of enforced and you carry those on when you have changes of, of staff. Um, that's, that's in terms of XAPI. Um, I think in learning analytics in general, a, a a mistake people often make is, is really trying to bite off too much all in one go um, rather than starting small. So I, I would encourage you try and if you can identify one problem that your organization has and solve that and get get a win there, um, that's a good starting point. Don't don't try and do everything all at once. Try and find a concrete problem that you can solve um, in a, a simpler way as possible. And that that just gets you into um, doing into doing learning analytics. Um, I suppose other mistakes, sometimes you can, you know, if you've got a limited amount of data, it's easy to draw conclusions when you really don't have enough data su to support that. Uh, so just be, be careful before jumping to conclusions on your data. And, you know, don't forget actually talking to people. Because, you know, quantitative data is really good. It helps you to see the overall picture. It's, you know, it's great. I mean, Watershed, our business is quantitative data. Um, so you should definitely have that. But also actually talking to people is really helpful as well to understand what the data is telling you um, and to actually just make sure you don't you don't make the wrong conclusions and perhaps point you in a direction to say, actually, well, we need, probably need to track that. We need to get more numerical data, more quantitative data to substantiate that particular story. You, you need both of them. They, they, they come hand in hand. That's that's probably it for, for mistakes. Um, do most L&D teams that you work with have a data scientist on, on the team? Um, well, I think most organizations don't have a data scientist on the learning analytics team. Um, there's a, we, we've been doing some surveys recently. I can't tell you the results of those yet, I don't think. But I think it's probably true that most, most organizations don't have a data scientist on their L&D team. Um, in terms of people that we work with, I think there's a variety. You know, we do have clients where they literally have a team of people that just do data. Um, and then we work with other people who, you know, the team that's, that's doing Watershed is two instructional designers who are you know, spending the majority of their time producing e-learning content, but they're also doing the, the learning analytics. So I think your, your team composition is really going to depend on the size of your organization. But if you can have somebody who is kind of going to take responsibility for, for playing that data scientist role, that analyst role, that that's going to be helpful to you. Um, and then you didn't ask this, but the other role that is good to have is someone who's a little bit more technical in terms of the code. We might call them a data engineer, perhaps. Um, someone who's going to be able to help you to do the technical side of, you know, perhaps programming some XAPI and and that sort of thing. Now, you, you can do all this stuff with off-the-shelf tools without having a data engineer, and you can explore the data without having a, a degree in statistics. Um, but obviously, the, the the more sophisticated you want to be, um, the, the more important it is to have those roles available. And wh whether that's a dedicated person or just someone who who's doing it as well as another role, again, depend on how far you want to go into it, I think. 
Um, any other questions? I think that's all the ones I can see. I think that is it. Hello, Megan. That might be it. But this has been fas like fascinating and awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew, is there anything that we should, uh, this is kind of a question, but since we've got five minutes and yeah, mention, and it's your Friday night, so everybody we want to kick Andrew off onto his, his Friday evening plans. Uh, actually, no, you're not because you're in the closing. You've got the, you've got the panel. Like, go that, 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 don't that's go my Friday yet. evening plans. <laughs> <laughs> so what questions should we have asked you or do you wish that some people have asked you? Oh, um, well, you could you could have asked me about some of the so some of the particular examples. You could have asked me for, for stories and case studies, I suppose. Um, and I think actually when you're getting started with a pilot, having stories is really helpful because you can say, look, this other organization have done it um, and either look at how they've done it um, at, or also just use, use that to convince people. Or you could have asked me about how to do specific things, more some of the more technical details, I suppose. Um, obviously not all of it, but we could have perhaps di dived into one of them if, if that was relevant. You had one, you, you had two cheat, was it cheating stories that you only told one? About yeah. that I don't have time, but I've got another cheating is interesting. You want another you want another cheating one. one? Yeah. So we don't think about cheating, but like it's a thing. Let me try and let me try and remember which two I Sorry. told and which two I okay. So that was the first. These are all my all my notes. Okay, so no. So yeah, the third example. Oh, I think actually, I think I've got two more. So I'm going to tell you two more. So apologies if I already told you one of these. So one of them was uh, people just spending an unrealistically short amount of time on content, which I think is one that happens all the time, where, you know, you've got an e-learning course, you designed it to take an hour, and someone's got through it in 10 seconds because they've just gone next, 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 next. Um, so that just can be helpful to identify. And we have had clients who've gone through, I, you know, they've spotted anyone who's taken less than 30 seconds to complete an e-learning course, delete that completion you've got to go and do, you've got to do it again um and then another one was uh, a client where they'd set up quite a, a slightly complicated structure because they, they didn't want to waste people's time and so the idea was you could either do a test and if you or ev everyone did a test and if you pass that test you then didn't have to do the e-learning e content you were done okay um but if you you only got one attempt at that test if you failed it you had to do the e-learning content, and then you did the same test again at the end, um, which you didn't actually have to pass, you, and you could take as many attempts at that as you wanted. But what they found when they looked at the data was that there were a number of people who were completing the, the post-test, the test that was supposed to happen at the end. They were going straight there. They were taking that test as many times as they needed to in order to find out what the right answers were, and then they were going back and having their sort of one only allowed attempt at the the pretest, the test that, that they could only have one try at. And so they were skipping the content by just getting the answers to the test uh, and do, doing the content in the wrong order. Which I mean, they weren't looking for that in the data. They just they were looking for a dashboard of scores to handle the, the complexities of some people did this test and some people did that test. But it. In as we were kind of debugging that that uh, that table of scores, it's like, well, this doesn't make sense. How is their highest score uh, different from the pretest score? You know, it, it didn't it didn't add up, and that's how we realised that people were doing it in the wrong order. We busted you, Matt Cleaver. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome, uh, Andrew. Thank you so much for this session. Super fun. Great examples. And um, we will, you get an hour break and then we'll bring you back in the yeah. other room, which means you, oh no, this room. You've got, never mind, you've got this one. You're good. Here, we'll yeah. see you in an hour. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. Bye. Thanks, everybody.